So, hello, welcome to densifying modular data centers with hybrid cooling. Um, after the last OCP summit, uh, I was reaching out to a couple of people. One who was kind enough to respond, my, my outreach was John from Meta, who is also the project lead for Redor uh, Heat Exchanger. And together with me, I also have David uh, Golnase from um, the uh, Liquid Cooling Challenge, no, Immersion Cooling Challenges. So three project leads coming together, um, trying to create a data center. Um, and uh, we'll we go into details, really trying to update liquid cooling from the perspective from the ORV3. Oh yeah, I'm Carl, hi, um, from Ubuntu Data Center. Good, it was on the slide. So um, what is a modular data center? It's basically, uh, the, the difference between the madness of a construction site and the uh, excellence and quality of a product finished in a factory. So we believe, uh, thinking about a data center, just coming off the module data center update, as the, the difference in terms of the pre-designed, pre-engineered, um, pre-tested. So what you put out on a edge site is really uh, a quality infrastructure product and we do have a couple of specifications in the model data center group. For example, the 90 kilowatt air cooled solution uh, supported by Schneider and PCX. And our latest addition, the uh, liquid cooling technology loop, loop heat pipe uh, data center from the company Thermocon, which we just recently released and we'll also add a design file to. So, what is, in our regard, hybrid cooling? Um, we all heard yesterday, uh, on yesterday's call about every um, company, basically, or presentation mentioning AI, and a lot of those workloads are liquid cooled. Uh, direct on ship, cold plate technology, and to to, to still cool off the remaining particle uh, the, or heat that is in air, we combine the cold plate technology with a rear door technology. And um, that is something that has been done already in, in the HPC world, but sees a new real boom now with uh, GPU chip design. Some of the advantages we go later into, and one really uh, prominent example we have through David, because he's an expert on heat readers. So what drives this? Um, obviously, a little bit the change in technology, and the technology that we heard in the keynotes that are always ever so growing in the TDPs that they, that they use. And uh, another driver, obviously, is the energy crisis, we have to be trying to reduce power and we ha have to trying to be smarter uh, with our power. What we're really trying to build is challenging the form factor that we use in the module data center group for different uh, specifications already. Um, the 90 kilowatt form factor probably will be rebranded to because we have so many uh, power associated to it. Um, just the base, like a very popular base, modular data center form factor. We want to see where are the limitations of the ORV3 with the um, direct liquid cooling manifolds and uh, what it takes to put it into a, uh, yeah, to, to combine it with a door heat exchanger. We also set out to maximize the usage of the space and see if we can eliminate air handling or other air handling. Um, and we also are able to reaching out to the industry and highlighting efficient uh, cooling technologies uh, in that regard. And we also want to see how, you know, for any real estate, location, location, location is the key, and what happens if you put s such a data center into different climate zones, into different locations. And we also wanted to have a heat reuse capability. And with that, I give over to John. Thanks, Carl. 
Uh, so as Carl highlighted the goals in the previous slide, uh, the first step was to focus on what we consider as the primary parameters of interest. And these can broadly be classified into uh, specific areas and dimensions, such as at the rack, at the white space, and the heat rejection mechanisms. So as Carl said previously, the first objective was to challenge the limitation of the power capability of a modular data center. So we initially set out a target of enabling at least 500 kilowatts of capacity in the same footprint as uh, the Schneider MDC contribution. And in order to do that, it became a very clear initially that we had to target rack powers uh, in excess of 50 kilowatts. But that had to be combined with a goal of maximizing that power as liquid and minimizing the air cool component of it. In order to have the heat rejection mechanisms operate very efficiently, we also wanted to push the operating temperatures higher, whether this was on the air side or the liquid side. And in order to show the impact of those changes, we also chose two locations that are fundamentally different from each other. And David will be talking about those in the following slides. So as previously stated, the goal was to was to increase the amount of rack power consumption. And the way we did that was we had to build uh, a rack TLA, and we leveraged the existing contribution in the OAI space, where the focus was liquid cooling of GPU and ASIC systems. Um, I want to thank Cheng Chen from Meta and Albert Lee from Weaven, who really helped with providing the data for this analysis. And you can use the, the QR code in the slide to download a pretty awesome white paper. So the information from that white paper and the rack TLA shown on the right-hand side enabled us to target 62 kilowatts per rack, um, with 48 kilowatts of that being liquid cool components. Um, and we were also able to uh, build this rack level TLA based on existing open compute architectures, such as the ORV3 rack flame, frame, uh, the blind mate liquid cooling system, if need be, um, as well as the power systems that are being contributed in the rack and power track in OCP. So breaking this down a little bit further, um, our analysis is, well, high level. I want to make sure that that's clear. Um, so at the end of the day, how you implement liquid cooling in the rack is entirely up to um, the end user. But over here, we want to call out the fact that OpenRack V3 um, is the first rack infrastructure where liquid cooling has been designed in from day one. So if required, you can adopt the blind mate liquid cooling, which was talked about earlier in this track today. Um, the QR code over there will give you access to the preliminary design documents as well as requirements that we have defined for dough heat exchangers and how they can be applied to OpenRack V3, which is the QR code at the bottom. Uh, one thing I do want to call out, which I didn't in the previous slide, was um, you know, some people will say, hey, that might be way too many GPUs in a rack. Uh, what I will say is that our intention from the get-go for this white paper was to maximize the amount of load in the rack. So that was our goal. So this slide over here shows uh, what the layout of the MDC would look like. Um, as we were able to uh, look at 62 kilowatt racks, which are predominantly liquid cooled, um, in the same footprint as uh, the Schneider specification, with 16 racks, we were able to achieve about one megawatt of IT load. Um, the picture on the right-hand side basically breaks down the space in the modular unit into three sections. The first one is the white space that accommodates 16 units. Uh, right next to it is the coolant distribution unit that is required to provide um, the fluid to the racks for cooling. Uh, and then at the end, we have space for uh, an electrical room to, uh, to provide the power to the units. One thing I do want to call out is that the complete built out footprint of this entire modular system is roughly 20 meters by 20 meters. 
So in order for us to size uh, the cooling solutions accordingly, um, which was specifically the, the CDUs for fluid transport as well as the heat rejection mechanisms to the external ambient, uh, we had to look at what the operating points would be. And the operating points were primarily driven by, by two things at the component. One was the component load, and then the second one was our appetite for how much margin to work into at the component level. So as such, we identified two different operating points. The first one was focused on maintaining about five degrees C, what we considered as five degrees C of margin at the component. Um, so these would be a thousand watt OAMs as highlighted in the white paper uh, with a case temperature of 60 degrees. The second one was more focused on heat reuse, which meant our focus was maximizing the return water temperature. So the way we achieved that was by reducing the flow rate to the rack um, while also minimizing the margins we would have at the component. And this would have an impact on how the heat rejection mechanisms would be sized, which is what David's gonna talk about next. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so um, for Frankfurt Climate, uh, we decided to go for around the year with uh, low flow rate. So uh, that uh, uh, flow rate uh, make impact on the uh, resistance pressure drops in cold plates, in manifold, in connectors, in heat exchanges, and that leads to the smaller pipes, smaller pumps, less energy consumption, less uh, investments. And um, uh, you see the peak period of the time when we have uh, 35 degrees uh, in uh, uh, cold oil, but 90% uh, of the time we have 26 degrees and the temperature of 65 degrees on the T case, we have uh, roughly 1% in the year. And uh, you can pay attention for the water consumption. Uh, adiabatic cooler work 99% of the time in dry mode. Uh, but let's go to the next slide and look for the same solution for Dubai. Uh, in Dubai's uh, Middle East, another climate. We are not able to achieve low temperature with adiabatic cooling. So we decided to go with two loops. One loop is for uh, door heat exchanger, which we connected with air cool chiller. And around here, we have 27 degrees in cold aisle. And second loop, only for the cold plates, with high flow rate in order to achieve high inlet temperature. So we um, achieve 43 degrees and overall delta T on cold plates uh, 11 degrees. In previous case, total uh, delta T in serial connection was 22. But we achieve um, very good PUE uh, and again, very low uh, water consumption. 98% of the year we work in dry mode. And the uh, TK is 65 degrees, we have roughly 5% during the all, overall the year. So uh, what challenges we have? Um, challenge was with the um, huge one megawatt capacity, electrical, all that infrastructure should be fitted in the same uh, space w or as uh, 90 uh, kilowatt, and uh, we fitted that there. Also, the pipes, uh, no matter it is um, 40 meter cubic or 57, we still uh, fit in uh, four inch tubes. And um, of course we fit in the same uh, footprint as uh, original version. And we have uh, good uh, air distribution and we have redundancy on that. So um, we used uh, uh, OAI uh, OCP servers with uh, standard tracks. Um, 
the room of improvement is that we can reduce the height of the server from 3U to 1U, and we are able to achieve 100 kilowatt per rack, among them 23 kilowatt uh, for door heat exchanges. And outdoor unit, we are able to increase in capacity for 1.8 megawatt uh, with the same footprint. And of course, there is a potential for making kit reuse. Uh, call to action is to uh, join to our work streams with that uh, QR codes, and also you can uh, get more information through the um, our wiki page and for heat exchanger, the door heat exchanger, and for modular data center. And we are here today and tomorrow to support you. Thank you for your attention. I'm assuming we have time for questions. Yeah. Three minutes. Just want to say the reason why Carl ran away is because he has three presentations back to back. So he actually ran over here from a previous presentation and now he's running back to another one. No question. I think we stunned everyone into silence. Thank you. Thank you.